Today, we're going to continue our conversation about uh, monopoly and corporate power with David Dayan, who's the executive editor at The American Prospect and also author of the new book Monopolize Life in the Age of Corporate Power. Uh, it's great to have you on, David. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks. So we recently spoke to Tom Hartman a little bit, who's also written about um, Monopoly, and uh, he looked very, very closely at some of the history of Monopoly power in the United States. Maybe we could start with you with a sort of where we are today. What what are the industries and areas where Monopoly power uh, seems to be sort of the prevailing force industries or, or, or other areas of American life? I think it would be easier to tell you what industries aren't. Okay. Uh, because it's uh it's a very pervasive situation. Uh basically look across the landscape of America and and all of these sectors of the economy and you find more concentration and more consolidation. And that stands to reason because uh 40 years ago we kind of stopped enforcing uh antitrust law and and anti-monopoly law. And, and this is the result. So you have, you know, four banks that control about 60 percent of all deposits four airlines that control 80 percent of domestic routes. You have concentration in hospital networks where locally uh, uh, in metropolitan areas, about 90 percent of those are highly concentrated. Uh, you have obviously pharmaceutical monopolies, the monopolies granted by the government. Uh, you have Facebook and Google and Amazon all uh, predominant in their various parts of the Internet search and social media and e-commerce. So uh, it's hard really to find uh, an area that isn't tightly concentrated at this stage. Is there a fixed uh, sort, sort of um, number that you look at in terms of X number of firms can, can uh, control Y percent of the market or does it really depend on the industry we're talking about? I mean, technically speaking, there is there's this thing called the Herfindahl Hirschman index, uh, which you don't have to know about anymore. But um, it, it basically means uh, it sets a number uh, above which uh, a certain level, uh, uh, you know, a market is highly concentrated. How you define a market sometimes comes into play with these. And and uh, at, at the at the level of enforcement, uh, sometimes that that line is drawn very tightly uh, to say, well, if you're talking about local search in this local area, uh, then maybe that's not tightly concentrated. But if you look sort of with your eyes in reality, then, yes, obviously a market is concentrated. Um, you know, there used to be much uh, more uh, uh, precise standards around this, that uh, there were market share thresholds where uh, if, if the Justice Department saw that uh, a company owned more or controlled more than 30 percent of a market or 35 or some number, uh, that they would step in and move to break up that 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 industry or 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 deny a merger for those reasons. Uh, we don't have that as much today. This Herfindahl Hirschman is very technical. Uh, as I say, you can draw the line in various different ways. And so um, you know, I prefer to look at this sort of in an, on an experiential basis. If you go out in the world and, uh, you know, you go into your supermarket aisle and you see the same, uh, it looks like a lot of, uh, different choices, but a lot of them are made by the same companies. Uh, if you, you know, try to rent a car or go on a flight or, or, you know, do the things that you do throughout your day, you find that there's more and more concentration within, uh, those sectors and those service providers. I think a lot of people, if asked what's the concern about monopoly power, overwhelmingly people would say, well, uh, if few firms control a market, they can drive up the price that I pay for a good or a service. Uh, it, it goes well beyond that, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, I mean, it doesn't go beyond that in terms of how the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission look at things that they have now this sort of consumer welfare standard. And that has really been devolved into price where if if prices are expected to go down, they approve the merger. Uh, but there's so much more that goes into it. You're talking about quality. Uh, you know, there's no incentive to to make a service better if uh, there's only one option that a person has. Uh, it, it, when you're talking about disruption of 
supply chains and disruption of service uh, that magnifies when there are only a few providers. Uh, you look at airlines that uh, uh, glitch often their computer systems and they shut down thousands of flights in a cascading fashion that wouldn't be as much of a problem if there were many service providers, many airline carriers uh, that were uh, you know, doing flights all around the nation. Uh, uh, you look at inequality and uh, 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 particularly regional inequality. If uh, the large firms on the coast are sort of extracting all the wealth from uh, areas uh, that are uh, you know, said to be left behind, then uh, that creates a regional imbalance, which has implications not just for the economy, but for our politics. Uh, if you uh, think about innovation, uh, the, if you have large firms that don't want competitors, they essentially sit on innovation, and find innovators and either copy their, their uh, efforts or, or squash their efforts or just buy them out and then and put them away. Uh, in the book, I talk about a number of these uh, 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 possibilities and, 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 and circumstances uh, where price is not the main driver of what the harm is. Uh, from monopoly. And so uh, I, I think there's a tremendous amount uh, of, of implications to a more concentrated system. I want to try to draw a little bit of a distinction maybe between some industries and others and, and kind of see where, where you come out on this. In thinking about airlines, for example, airlines are a little different than some other industries in that the capital required because you're talking about outrageously expensive airplanes. Uh, it, the, the capital required is much higher than in certain other industries, like, for example, to open a local bookstore, which might eventually be driven out of business by Amazon. Can you talk a little bit about what type of changes or solutions you would like to see within the airline industry? Because it seems very tough to um, do anything other than break up airlines once they get too big, because the barriers to entry to begin with are just so high. I mean, what you're talking about there uh, and and you see this in utilities, for example. So it doesn't cost it's not cost effective to run seven different wires to a particular residence and have that person pick and choose between the best service. Right. Uh, that just that just would be completely uh, cost prohibitive. So what do we do with utilities? We heavily regulate them so that they have a natural monopoly. But uh, we we put them in a situation where they're not gouging customers, where they're not uh, providing substandard service uh, and things like that. And so you can uh, sort of extend that out, the regulated public utility model. And it actually uh, uh, historically is how we handled airlines in the 1930s. We had a, a, a regulating uh, board called the Civil Aeronautics Board that said, OK, you can uh, uh, you can have a certain amount of profit for a certain uh, 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 level of capacity on your airline. But you also have to serve the entire country. You have to make sure that if you live in Topeka, Kansas, or if you live in uh, Portland, Maine, you have access to airlines uh, and, 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 and flights and travel uh, that allows us to connect the entire country together. What we did in the 1970s, we deregulated the airlines. Uh, this led at first to an explosion of competition, actually, but then it all, uh, it, was, it, was, it was not a virtuous competition. Everyone was lowering and lowering prices and then they it completely cost ineffective. And then you had this, this giant amount of mergers and now, what we have with the hub and spoke model is that certain cities have been just completely left behind. They, there just is no airline service to large sections of the country and certainly not direct flights. Uh, and as cities like Cincinnati and, and, and others have, have seen their, their international airports sort of wither and then seen businesses who, who rely on business travel leave those areas. And, and move to larger parts of the country. So this, this sort of with a flick of a wrist and, and the change of a, a, where a hub is, you can turn a city from a, a, a world-class city into a second-class city. And what the Civil Aeronautics Board did was it, it was trying to prevent that. It was trying to sort of level the playing field. 
And so what I think needs to be done is that when you have businesses like airlines or utilities, uh, you regulate them in such a way that provides the most service to the most people uh, with with the least disruption. And uh, so airlines is actually a very good model for this concept of a regulated public utility. Can you talk a little bit about which uh, industry monopolies have been exposed through coronavirus specifically? Are there are there certain specific areas we should be looking where the, the virus and the pandemic have sort of shined a light on, hey, this industry, that industry is very much under monopoly control? Well, I think what's happened is uh, it's accelerated. Uh, 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 trends that we've seen for the last 40 years uh, for a combination of factors. Number one, it's simply the case that small businesses do not have the kind of cash reserve that large businesses do. And we've seen thousands, tens of thousands of small businesses go under, thereby giving more market share to the large incumbents. Uh, the second reason is the CARES Act, uh, which provided uh, massive amounts of support for large businesses particularly those uh, who are public, publicly traded companies, uh, by propping up asset prices, whereas small businesses got this PPP, which is an eight-week uh, uh, fund for uh, funding uh, payrolls. Uh, obviously, we're in the sixth months, month of this pandemic, so eight weeks was definitely not enough. And this imbalance has led to more and more uh, uh, market share going towards the top. And then the third thing is, uh, the, the changes in sort of our, our patterns of life, uh, working from home, uh, doing deliveries, that has benefited the large incumbents like Amazon, like uh, 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 certainly the, 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 the technological uh, uh, things like Skype, what we're using now, which is a, a division of Microsoft or uh, Google tools or, or things that people are using to make the work from home process work. Uh, so, you know, I think I think what I would say is it's accelerated this trend. Uh, and now we're at a position where five major tech stocks are roughly one quarter of the value of the entire S&P 500, which has never been seen before in history. So we're we're getting into this position with fewer and fewer uh, uh, companies controlling more and more of the economy. And it's very dangerous for all the reasons that we've outlined. In the sort of limited time we have left, what do you think is responsible for getting the U.S. away from uh, de breaking up monopolies? And and actually, it's not even about uh, creating law, really just enforcing the laws that that are there and were enforced more strictly for, for a time. Is it as simple as regular regu regulatory capture and um, the connections between the political system and these corporations? Or is it more more complex than that? You can really boil it down to one man, and that man is named Robert Bork. Uh, he was the uh, uh, former Reagan nominee for the Supreme Court. He was a failed uh, 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 nominee uh, for the Supreme Court, but he had much more impact uh, outside of, of the federal bench. Uh, he wrote the book The Antitrust Paradox in 1978, which sort of brought us this consumer welfare uh, 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 prism through which to, to view mergers. Uh, his idea was as long as a merger makes uh, 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 the merge company more efficient, then we should allow the merger. And his corollary was that any merger makes a company more efficient. So it was perfectly tautological reasoning uh, uh, that, that essentially made it impossible to stop a merger. Uh, and it was internalized by both the antitrust authorities, the Justice Department changed its guidelines in 1982 based on Borkian principles, and also the federal judiciary, which internalized these concepts as well. So uh, thanks to Bork and, and, and the ideas that he brought forward with the law and economics movement, which uh, you know was largely uh, out of the University of Chicago, uh, we we have you know changed and reinterpreted all of these century old antitrust laws without really changing a word. Uh, what is what is changing now is we're starting to get an awareness of that, uh, and there's sort of a nascent movement of thinkers and journalists and and, and uh, academics who are pushing back finally on on this sort of Borkian concept 
of antitrust. And uh, we're starting to see this bubble up in the political system. Uh, you know, in July, we had the House Antitrust Subcommittee have the, the CEOs of all the major tech companies in for a hearing, which was very aggressive as to their anti-competitive harms uh, that they were uh, placing on, on businesses and uh, partners that work with them, as well as the public. Uh, so I think the way that we're going to counteract this is through a political movement. Uh, that's really the only way that, that the antitrust laws got put in place in the first place. And it's the only way that we're going to get a, a re-reinterpretation of them, if you will, uh, to, to restore the concepts that were brought forward uh, initially with these laws, which was to pr protect and preserve competition. Well, uh, well said. We've been speaking with David Dayan, who's the executive director at the American Prospect. The book is monopolized life in the age of corporate power. David, really appreciate your time. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me and thanks for your interest.